How could fears over a U.S. recession have sparked a massive stock market crash in Tokyo that wiped out 12% of its value? More importantly, what does that stock market route in Japan have to say about prospects for a U.S. recession? Well, not anything good, that's for sure. And it's a lot more than just Japanese equities, and it's a lot more than just a U.S. economy recession. This whole thing can't just be about the U.S. The entire world seems to be going through recession at the same time. The American economy is merely a late arriving guest at the globally synchronized party because globally synchronized isn't just a slogan. The world is far more interconnected than you're ever led to believe. Think about it this way. If the global economy is really global, then what power or even influence would national central banks and authorities really have? Well, it might not be zero, it's much closer to zero than not. And where does the public get all of its commentary on the economy? From central bankers. Our entire economic worldview is oriented around national groupings, not because that's the way the world works, but because it keeps them in their job. But this is wrong, and it's been that way for a very, very long time, and you really do have to get out of that mindset. And this is another one of those things you don't have to take my word for. it. Global recessions and downturns have been pretty well documented, as we'll see here. But this is why we pay close attention to Europe, China, and yes, Japan. If there are big enough problems in one place, it won't stay in one place for very long. So should the dominoes begin to fall one by one, you know it's only a matter of time for everyone else. And at that point, you're just trying to guess where you are in that line. It's why we look at the bond market, bond market changes, and curve shapes. Because that's where it all begins. The interconnected and integrated global economy starts with euro dollars and finance. So if those begin to price real trouble, then it doesn't matter what Jay Powell says. He's only looking out for his own job, not for yours. And it's been this way for a very long time. Even the global not financial crisis in 2007 and 2008, the reason it was global was because of this interconnected system. August 9, 2007 was the beginning of a global breakdown, not just in the monetary system or even the financial system with volatility, but for the entire global economy. One by one, the dominoes would fall from there. And you could tell it was going to be a worldwide event from what happened early in the morning on August 9th of 2007. This is something that I wrote afterward, celebrating, quote unquote, celebrating the anniversary of August 9th, which we just did 17 years ago. What I wrote was, these were European money market funds domiciled in France and Liechtenstein, sponsored by a French bank invested primarily in U.S. dollar asset-backed securities to beat euro money market rates. What matters about geography here? It's because it's a globally synchronized and integrated system. European banks started to fail. The consequences were felt all over the world, including the U.S. It was not subprime mortgages. It was this interconnected, integrated euro dollar system and when the euro dollar system worked before the crisis it worked very well in fact it worked too well but during that the euro dollar's heyday the globe the world experienced a period of unparalleled prosperity but therein lay the trap therein was the weakness the inherent flaw because as it started to go wrong in one part that almost guaranteed it would go wrong in all the other parts but this was not the first time that we had a global recession either Globally integrated and interconnected systems had, had, had uh, developed long before then. The difference in 2008 and 2009 wasn't that it was global. It was the, the, the depth and the degree of that setback. It was a monetary panic, not merely just a global recession. But we have had global recessions before. But before we get to those... Let's talk about the interconnected, integrated Eurodollar system itself and how we can see it's integrated and interconnected through nothing more than nominal interest rates. I'm going to show you charts here for the 10-year U.S. Treasury as well as the 10-year JGB and the 10-year German Bund. And they all show the same thing. While they're not exact and they don't move exactly the same, you can very much see how, how much of a correspondence there is between these various markets, which are supposed to be very different markets. The economic circumstances of the United States does not match those of Japan, at least not from the outside, or at least not from the perspective of national economies. At the same time, U.S. Treasuries, the characteristics, the credit characteristics, the fundamental characteristics of the U.S. government that issues those U.S. Treasuries is absolutely nothing like 
their German counterparts, who are more prudent and fiscally responsible. Yet, you can see that there is a very clear relationship between all of these various bonds, especially the 10-year maturity when you get further away from central bank influences at the front end. Just over the last couple of years, you can see rising rates uh, 2021, 2022 into 2023, but just last summer, last summer during the September effect. And the September effect is something that shows up in all three of these markets as well. You go back to 2018, JGBs behaved the same as German bonds and U.S. treasuries. But it happened last year too. You had a September effect in Japan and Germany as well as the treasury market. But then the global bond market rally, which began first in Germany, then hit the U.S. Treasury market, then finally JGBs, all in a matter of just a couple weeks. And throughout November and December, it was a rally in all three. We've got the pause in 2024, consistent with the historical pattern. And then the next leg in the rally, which developed in U.S. Treasuries first, then the German market, and then a couple days afterward in JGBs, leading us up to the current moment. So we had a sharp drop in yields in treasuries and German bonds and even Japanese government bonds, despite the Bank of Japan's latest rate hikes. And up until the, the financial volatility, they had threatened to do even more. But this correlation goes back a very long way. Again, it's not a perfect correlation. It's not an exact correlation. During the 2010s, for example, in the early part of the 2010s, coming out of the 2008 not financial crisis, U.S. Treasuries and German bonds were almost in perfect lockstep fashion. You'd also see a more than passing resemblance in JGBs. All three started to move lower uh, in the aftermath of the crisis because lower growth and inflation expectations for the global system, not for Japan or just Japan or just Germany or just the United States. It was the entire world that was falling into the silent depression. And you can see it in all three very different markets, or what's supposed to be very different markets. There was high degree of synchronization between all three. And during Euro dollar number three, for example, which was 2014, 2015, and early part of 2016, all three of those markets were acting very much in exactly the same way. There was some dispersion through 2017's globally synchronized growth, the problem with that term, of course, was the growth, not the globally synchronized, where the U.S. Federal Reserve influenced the front end of the U.S. Treasury curve more than the European Central Bank, which was still at zero, and the Japanese Central Bank, which was at negative rates. In fact, the European Central Bank had negative rates as well. So U.S. Treasuries diverged only because of the Federal Reserve's interference, but yet when you get to euro dollar number four, 2018 into 2019, all three of them converge again globally synchronized downturn, maybe even a recession at that time. It wasn't just the U.S., it wasn't just Japan, even though the Japanese actually declared a recession many years later. It was a global issue in 2019. And we could see that in this close, close correlation among bond markets. And this, again, go, this goes back before the 2008 crisis. It goes back before August 9th of 2007. We'll pick it up here in the middle of the 1990s, even before we got to the Asian not financial crisis, which was really a rehearsal for what happened in 2007 and 2008. You see Treasury yields and JGBs peak around May and June of 1996. Then from there, JGBs go down pretty steadily, while U.S. Treasury yields were kind of sideways back and forth until April of 1997. But from April 1997, when the Asian not financial crisis really started to get going, there you go, synchronized fashion, J and the German bonds come in there as well. So rates go down steadily through 97 into 1998, with lows in the Japanese market as well as the Treasury market on October 5th of 1998. Now, rates in Germany would take a little bit longer to get to their, po their bottom, but by 1999, early 1999, after the Trust Fund Bureau shock in Japan, Ger German rates as well as Treasury rates are rising in 1999 to early 2000. Well, in Japan, after the Trust Fund Bureau shock, they were mostly sideways there. And then, of course, the dot-com cycle. Starting in January of 2000, you've got German bonds as well as U.S. Treasury yields that are starting to roll over and move lower. That says the dot-com bust, the peak of the dot-com stock market bubble. And then you have all three of them falling together during 2001's dot-com recession and even the weak economy that followed afterward. We had a jobless recovery in the United States, but that, that weakness spread throughout the, the rest of the world because it was a global downturn. And even the Bank of Japan, 
in March of 2001, first experimented with its very first QE. It blamed this globally synchronized downturn and recession for it. Here's what the Bank of Japan statement said when announcing QE. Japan's economic recovery has recently come to a pause after it slowed in late 2000 under the influence of a sharp downturn of the global economy. Prices have been showing weak developments and there's concern about increased downward pressures on prices stemming from weak demand, not just in, in Japan, but all around the world. So Japan experimented with a QE because Japan was experiencing a globally synchronized downturn. This is 2001, and it was a globally synchronized downturn that was priced into German markets, US markets, as well as the Japanese government bond markets. We saw it in all three of those, and it would continue afterwards. In, both of the, in all three of those markets after the 2000, 2001, 2002, and into 2003 dot-com cycle, rates picked up in all three during the middle 2000s. We'll really call it a recovery, but at least during that expansionary period. You saw rates back up in the United States, still not very much. You saw rates back up in Germany, though not very much. You saw rates go up a little bit in Japan, despite the Bank of Japan's later rate hikes. And the only reason why they didn't go up, rates didn't go up much in the, that period was because the market was picking up on what was coming next, which was also globally synchronized. The World Bank in March of 2020, so before really the pandemic gave us the next globally synchronized economic cycle and, and really economic disaster, they wrote a paper called Global Recession in which they examined the fact that there have been global recessions and global downturns as they call them, they classify them differently, but global recessions and global downturns going back a long, long ways. Here's what they say. The world economy has experienced four global recessions over the past seven decades. In 1975, 1982, 1991, and of course, 2009. During each of these episodes, annual real per capita global gross domestic product contracted. And this contraction was accompanied by weakening of other key indicators of global economic activity. The global recessions were highly synchronized internationally with severe economic and financial disruptions in many countries around the world. And in addition to the four global recessions, the global economy experienced low growth in 1958, 1998, which was the Asian not financial crisis, 2001, which was the dot-com cycle, and 2012, which was what we call Eurodollar number two. In these four years, the global economy registered its lowest growth rates of the past seven decades, except for those prior global recession years and the two years before and after each of them. But it doesn't matter. It was close enough. So it wasn't classified as a global recession, say in 2012, but it was a global downturn nonetheless, and it was synchronized. The U.S., for example, did not hit a recession in 2012, but it was very close. We got a very weak reading in the U.S. economy because the U.S. economy was weak at the same time Euros, Europe was in recession. At the same time, China slowed down very sharply and which from which none of us have ever been able to recover. 2012 may have been only a global slowdown or a global downturn, but it was synchronized nonetheless and it was the, it was the final nail in the silent depression. And this paper even picks up on our Eurodollar cycles, though they don't know where they're coming from. They're merely documenting the evidence across a lot of economies around the world and finding that it is synchronized. Integration through the Eurodollar system, which means close connections, globalized trade, but more so globalized financial flow. So here the World Bank is documenting the consequences of these Eurodollar cycles without understanding that they are Eurodollar cycles. It's a global system and it's made to be a global system by the Eurodollar. But here's the thing here. What they also write is, in all four global recessions, as well as the global downturns, the fraction of countries in recession started picking up ahead of the recession year. So we get a warning about a global recession before it strikes, and just from the, from, just from the macroeconomic data, which is certain economies or, or more economies begin to show recessionary signs, and then you see the dominoes begin to fall. And that's exactly what the globally synchronized markets are pricing. When rates are going down, it's not stimulus, it's not central bank policies, especially when you get out to the 10 year maturity in these markets, it's lower growth and inflation expectations with an emphasis on the growth part. 
lower growth expectations consistent with a widespread, synchronized, at least downturn, if not global recession. That's what we've been getting very strongly since the bond market rally last year. That the Japanese recession, for example, wasn't just going to be a Japanese recession. Or Europe that has been recession since 2022 wasn't going to just be Europeans, Europeans' problem. You put all of these together, China slowing down, the dominoes have been falling. And as the bond market has been rallying in all three of these markets, including JGBs, once they get past the Bank of Japan's rate hikes, it all adds up to globally synchronized. Because it is not a US system or European system that has these certain linkages together, we have an overlay, a monetary financial overlay, this Euro dollar system that closely integrates the US with Europe, with Asia and everything else in between, with emerging markets in Australia and Oceania and everything else. It's a global system. But the reason you haven't heard about this global system is because we get all our information from national authorities. And national authorities don't have as much authority in a global system. The U.S. Federal Reserve claims that it regulates the U.S. monetary and financial system. But if the U.S. monetary and financial system isn't a U.S. system, instead a global system, what does the Fed actually do? You start asking all the wrong questions. So they're not going to really talk as much about how integrated this world economy actually is. The world financial system, really the world's reserve currency monetary system. We call it U.S. dollar. It's denominated in U.S. dollar, but it is the euro dollar. And that's why we have euro dollar cycles, even going back to 1975 and 1981-82, as the World Bank paper cited. These were euro dollar cycles as much as they were global recessions. And we get a number of clues when we see these global recessions and global downturns develop. First of all, macroeconomic data. When we see one economy after another, after another, after another start to fall into recession, that's a warning for everyone else. It's not, okay, sorry, Japan's in recession, too bad for Japan, or China's really slowing down, too bad for China, or Europe can't seem to get out of its own way, too bad for Europe. Those are all related together. It means that one domino after another have already fallen, and so we need to be on watch for when it's our turn for our domino to fall over as well. And that's what markets have been telling us more strongly and strenuously in recent months. This financial volatility wasn't really about Jap Japan, wasn't about Japanese stocks, nor was it really about prospects for the U or U.S. recession. It was what the U.S. recession possibly confirms about globally synchronized. And more than that, what it confirms about potentially the severity of globally synchronized. Because if the U.S. goes down, especially with the downside of the supply shock, it implies severity in the financial volatility also implies this is not just a small U.S. recession or a small one for the rest of the world. It suggests that we're talking about some of the more adverse cases, which is where bond yields are heading in synchronized fashion. Of course, it's not just about bond markets and interest rates. It goes much further than that. I talked about a couple of critical signals and what they're suggesting about where the global economy is heading in the video link below. As always, thank you very much for joining me. Huge thank you, Eurodollar University members and Eurodollar University subscribers. And until next time, take care.